warning. I'm about to invite you into a topic that might be a little bit uncomfortable, even though I think it's terribly exciting. You see, I'm a music therapist in elder care for a large part because I enjoy making music with older adults. I love that face-to-face -face experience of musicing with other people. I treasure that time that I get to spend making music with older adults, but I also figured out a while back that I can't personally do music with the millions of Americans who are in their 80s and 90s and beyond, and even the 8,000 board certified music therapists in the United States are not enough to make music with all the older adults. And the numbers, as Meredith mentioned earlier, the numbers of older adults are just getting bigger. So we have to begin expanding our role in elder care as music therapists so that we can bring meaningful music experiences to older adults all the way to the end of life. We have to begin expanding our role beyond direct service to teaching other elder care professionals how to use music as a tool within their own work. Now this idea might make you feel a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit territorial. I know in recent years we've had a lots of apps and programs and things emerge in senior living and hospice and different areas of elder care. And every time this happens, music therapists we say, oh no, this is not music therapy, this is not music therapy. Um, and I know that it can feel a little bit uncomfortable to think about these programs as something that can be integrated into the way that we work. But I think that by the time I finish this brief talk that I'm doing today, that you're gonna feel a little bit more confident about your role as an expert in elder care and be willing to step into that role as a consultant, as a teacher, as a mentor, so that elder care professionals can use these tools that are available to them more effectively so that the older adults that we all care for can access those meaningful music experiences all the way to the end of their lives. So before we get to go to the programs and apps and things like that that exist now and how we as music therapists can help elder care colleagues of ours to use those tools appropriately, I think it's important to visit where we came from. Now I have been in the profession for 14 years, which is really not that long except when you consider how much music technology has changed. So. Um, Back when I started my career, 2004, my very first contract was in, with a nursing home in Newton, Kansas, a little town, first music therapist there. And every week, every Wednesday morning, I'd go to the community and I'd unpack my, uh, my little Kia Rio, get out of my truck, and I would get my guitar and my instruments for those live music making experiences that we're also familiar with in elder care. And then I would get my boom box, about this big, had a little handle on it for a couple years until it broke off. So my boot box, and then I had a folder with about eight CDs. I would take them out of their plastic cases and put them in this folder so that I could have enough music, enough recorded music, to take with me to these sessions. Now, at that time, I was the bringer of music. So that was my primary role when I was going into senior living. I would be going there, um, with these meaningful music experiences, with these songs that I had carefully chosen, favorite songs maybe that I've learned that residents have asked me for, and that I practiced at home, and come in there and um, play music together. Play our guitar, play my guitar, play instruments together. And then I also was bringing in recorded music because it was important to a lot of these residents so that they get to hear the authentic original recordings of a lot of artists. I am who I am, I sound nothing like, Elvis Presley or Tennessee Ernie Ford, and it was really important to be able to give residents that opportunity to hear those artists. I remember one particular session that was near Halloween, and um, I played the recording of the song Purple People Eater, that, you know, that song, and um, engaged all the residents in making music around this recording. They gave everybody some instruments, and there's places in the song where you can all stop together and then start again. So we were engaging in music in this very deeply musical experience around this recording of the Purple People here. After the session was over, the activity director came over to me and said that she wished that she had a copy of that CD and she wondered where I got it. And it was a compilation that I picked up at you know, Target somewhere along the way. And um, 
she had a Halloween CD too, but it was all like weird special effects and it wasn't really going to work for her Halloween party. But she didn't have the budget to buy any more CDs and she didn't know where to find them. She understood that the right music could set the right tone for the activity that she was going to be facilitating, but she didn't have the right tools at her disposal to make that happen. It's not that activity directors and caregivers didn't want to share music with people back then, 14 years ago when I was getting started. It's not that they weren't capable of being the bringer of music, but they didn't have the tools available. I had spent thousands of dollars and many hours finding uh, CDs to add to my collection. I still have the boxes in my garage. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I put a lot of work into that as a music therapist based on the knowledge I have to build that collection. Um, I had the resources and the tools at my disposal to be able to do that, and the people that I was working with did not. Fast forward, here we are in 2018, and probably everybody in this room has something like this in your pocket or your bag, or if you don't have a smartphone or a tablet, you have some kind of internet connected device that allows you to access pretty much all the music that has ever been recorded. So now it's really easy for anybody to pull up a recording of Tennessee Ernie Ford singing 16 tons in that really low voice that I can do any justice. And it's not just activity professionals or administrative people or management types that have access to these tools, but it's CNAs, dietary staff, family members, and half the residents in a senior living community have these devices as well. And so people have the tools to access this meaningful music, these experiences that they so want to have, and that we all deserve to have. But despite the fact that all of these tools are available now, not a lot has changed in senior living in many of the communities I go to. People that I see are still starved for the music that they love. They still have a hard time getting to hear the music from artists that made a big difference to them when they were young. Um, there are still people who are doing their exercises every day to the same CD or the same video that they've been using for a really long time. Things that have gotten stale over time. There's a lot of room for improvement. All these tools are there, but they're not being used. Why is this? Well, I think that available musical tools can be overwhelming for a lot of our colleagues in elder care. Speaking to an audience of music therapists, we get excited about the fact that you know we can access all of you know 20 recordings of Love Me Tender and compare and contrast and pick which one, that kind of thing. But when I went to Home Depot the other weekend, I went there with the idea of I just wanted to hang up some curtains. I went to the hardware aisle to find the appropriate thing to hang the thing on the wall, and they were like. 250 different drill bits that I could choose from, along with the selection of drills. I had a drill at home, but is it the right one? I don't know. And so you can picture me standing here in the aisle just waiting for one of those people in the vest to come over and rescue me and tell me which little piece of metal I need to buy so that I can go home and hang up my curtains, right? This is what it's like for a lot of elder care professionals. There are so many musical tools available, they don't know how to pick one and how to use it once they have it in their hands. So that is the role that music therapists can step into naturally, is to bridge that gap and help people um, know what tools are available and how to use them most effectively. I want to say again that I know it can be very frustrating to hear me up here telling you to be in a new role, to be a consultant or a teacher or a mentor. Those are not things that we're necessarily comfortable with. We get comfortable being the bringer of music, the people who facilitate these meaningful music experiences. That's what we practice when we are in school to become music therapists, and that is the craft that we have cultivated over many years of practice. We're not comfortable with management. Supervision is not a basic competency for us. And if you're an employee of a community, you might feel like nobody cares what you have to say anyway. It might be really hard to get the ears of the decision makers in your community. And if you're in business, well, you probably don't know how to charge for consultation or for mentorship, and you only have so much time in the day. So I know that it can be frustrating and challenging to ask you to step into this role, but again, there's a bigger picture here. 
We have these tools available, and there are people who are with older adults that are having difficulty accessing music with them all the time. I'm only going to be with an older adult maybe one day, two hours, maybe five hours a week at most. But there are professionals there all the time. There are caregivers, and there are residents who can use tools on their own. And if we can make those tools available and give them help to figure out how to employ those tools, then more people will get to have the meaningful music experiences that they deserve. Okay, so what are the tools? I see three broad categories in the variety of apps and programs and things that are out there now and that are marketed specifically to senior living communities, to hospices and home care agencies, other elder care agencies or, or organizations that serve older adults. And keep in mind that there was an old way of delivering music, now there's a newer way, so there's nothing brand new here, but we do have some advanced technology. So the first category I see is environmental or community music. These are the kinds of programs and apps that are meant to play music in a public or communal area to create a certain kind of atmosphere, or maybe to set the tone for an activity or to um, give people something to gather around. So the old way to do this was to have your CDs and play it on your boombox for the Halloween party, right? But we don't have to do CDs and boomboxes now because we can use our internet connected devices to go to, to use YouTube, to use Spotify, things like that to access digital music. And specifically in working with older adults in elder care, um, there is a tool called Music First that comes from a company called Coro Health. What this is, is curated music programs that are, you can choose them based on the time of day, the genre, and the style that you're looking for for a particular scenario. So for example, you could choose classic country music to play for breakfast time. So music that has been selected to you know, generate some energy, help people get a little bit woken up, focused on the task at hand, maybe encourage eating, right, to encourage appetite. I've seen these programs in use in some of the communities I go to, and I think they're really cool. I think there's a lot of possibilities there. The problem with things like this is that they can be underutilized. People are scared of new technology and so might not try to use them. Another potential problem is, you know, if there's tech problems, who's going to fix it? Who's going to make sure that things are, are managed well? And who's going to keep that technology top of mind for people who are in a position to use it? Who's going to encourage them and keep saying, use this tool, use this tool, use this tool? That's a place where music therapists can step in. Another broad category of the music programs and apps available in elder care is with individualized music. This is where music and memory comes into play. Now the old way, again, was to have blue boxes and CDs or, you know, LPs and record players before that. And to make it individualized, order stuff from the library or help residents with making their own music purchases to make their personalized music available to them. The new way, the technology that we have now, is to use iPods, to use um, smartphones, tablets, to put playlists together of digital music and to make those available to residents and other older adults. Music and Memory does this really well. They have, have come up with a great way of systemizing this process of uncovering people's music process, uh, preferences and putting together a playlist of autobiographical music, music that is connected to who they are as a person. And then those iPods or those devices can then be made available to residents, to people in hospice, um, so that they have their favorite music and the music that is meaningful to them personally. Now the thing with an individualized music program is that it can be really complicated as a system to manage. There are a lot of moving parts. You have to have a central library to collect all the music. You have to have um, people to make sure that things are getting charged and distributed the right way. And so as music therapists, the way we can step into that gap is by encouraging people to keep up the system and identifying the problems and making it work. We know how beneficial music experiences can be, so we're in a good position to help encourage that along. 
Now the third and final category I see in the music programs and categories of music apps and things like that offered in senior living and elder care is with live music. We all know how powerful it is for our people to engage in live music experiences. We also know that it takes a special person to engage people in that kind of live music making experience. So the old way was to get volunteers, entertainers, sing-alongs, people to come in and play the pianos and do sing-alongs. There are also tapes, like VHS tapes with sing-alongs on them. There's DVDs like that too, with the lyrics on screen, screen karaoke style. Of course, karaoke is a mass market way of having a live music experience, and we can help people play the YouTube videos with the lyrics so they can sing along with that. There is also an app like SingFit. SingFit is an app um, that's kind of like karaoke with some extra benefits because it includes some voice prompting. There's some ways that you can change the track so that it's in a more singable register. And um, there's different ways to use the app. And, and they've done a lot of, they put a lot of consideration into how can we give people a meaningful live music experience using this app. The problem, with the live music programs, the live music apps, is that you still have to have somebody who is in a leadership role in the music. So normally, for us, that would be the music therapist who is there to be the strong voice who is bringing people into the music. But when you have an app, um, a computer can't really do that very effectively. So you have to have um, a participant, older adult in the group, or an activity staff member, or a CNA, or somebody who has the energy and the, the presence to invite people into the music. If that piece is missing, then the program doesn't work, it gets put on a shelf, and I've seen that over and over. So what can we do? We can step into that gap and help to identify those leaders and to give them the tools that they need to lead those engaging music experiences. Now there are more apps and programs emerging all the time. The same problem, though, happens everywhere. The tools are there, but people don't know how to use them. As music therapists, we can not only see the problems, those gaps, but we can figure out ways to bridge them so that the elder care professionals know which musical tools to use and when. This means senior living residents and hospice patients and older adults in the community will get to hear and make the music that they love, that all of us deserve, all the way to end of life. That's it.